listening to Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. We're now on SoundCloud. Visit us on SoundCloud.com slash Out of the Box Podcast. And as always on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, if you subscribe and like us, leave a comment. That helps us out a lot. I am here today with Kevin Griffin, Buddhist teacher and author of One Breath of a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps. How are you doing today, Kevin? Great. How are you, Rosie? Good. Um, I'm really excited to interview you because you have such an interesting story. Um, now, you actually started as a rock guitarist. Yes, and uh, I guess once a guitarist, always a guitarist. I, I <laughs> still play a little bit. Uh, I don't go hang out in bars a lot, but uh, yeah. You started out kind of in the rock scene of the 70s and early 80s in L.A. That sounds kind of crazy. Yes, uh, I suppose it was crazy. I guess that's what I wanted was to get crazy, you know, (laughs) it's all about. Um, How did you go from that to being a Buddhist teacher all around the world? Well, uh, you know, I I think for me, fundamentally, music really is spiritual to me. And, and, um, you know, even though there was that sort of party side to it, you know, the real heart of it for me was a longing for something meaningful and, and um, you know, something that could bring meaning to other people's lives through music. So, um, you know, along with my musical life, I also had kind of a spiritual journey that was going on. And, and um, you know, as the music career kind of faded, I realized you know, that I needed to find some, some meaning, something that really resonated for me in my life. And, you know, and that's when I, I turned to meditation. I mean, I'd always been interested in in meditation, but I finally kind of got around to doing it. And, and then eventually realized that, you know, my drinking and drugging was getting in the way of any kind of authentic spiritual practice. As for becoming a teacher, really, the way I see it and what I tell people who talk about wanting to be teachers is that becoming a meditation teacher is simply uh, an outgrowth of your own practice. So it was really my own meditation practice for you know fifteen or twenty years that uh, you know made it gave me the you know, sort of skills or knowledge to be able to pass it on to other people. Now, oftentimes with a spiritual awakening, um, you know, some people can go lightly, but a lot of times it's a very painful awakening or a rock bottom that gets people to jolt out of one lifestyle into realizing that they need to, like you said, maybe um, let go of some alcohol or drugs to reach what you were looking for. Was that the case with you or... Was it just, hey, I need to stop doing this? Oh, no. I mean, it was definitely, you know, my life uh, sinking lower and lower. And and in some ways, you know, I think I hit my rock bottom a few years before I even was able to turn things around. Because I sort of say that I, w- I was below my bottom. I had to get up, raise my life quality of my life to a point where I could actually see um, another way. Uh, But yeah, for sure, you know, even though I thought I was on a spiritual path, I was also still drinking and having blackouts. And my, as I say, my musical career was just kind of on the rocks and and my relationships and all of it, you know. Um, But but like a lot of people, you can live, uh, you know, I was able to live like that in denial for quite a while, at least for a few years. Um, and, uh, and it was just kind of, there, there is kind of a moment. There was for me kind of a moment of just sort of going, you know, what am I doing? This doesn't work. Was it an aha moment, like a profound, some people describe it as a profound wake-up call? What I mean, do you mind describing that moment? Or? Uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't mind describing it. First of all, I have to say that, you know, what really, what laid the foundation for the final turnaround was was being with a, 
a girlfriend who w- was saying that I had a problem, you know, was really putting it in front of me very clearly. So I had never really had anybody tell me that. And so, and then, so six months of hearing that <laughs> helped. Uh, and, Honey, you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Me and I drink. So, but uh, but then there was you know it was just it's a it's a weird thing how it hits you. Some I was playing a gig with a band outside L.A. Um, and we got fired from the gig, and the drummer said something to me about how he hated being in bars and being around drunks as he walked out the door at the end of the night. And I just heard that in a way that it it really hit me like, wow, because I really respected this guy. He was a studio player who had helped me out and done me a favor to play with me that week. And there he was getting fired, which he didn't deserve, but it was because of me. Were you and, drunk? Were you drunk at the time? I was uh, not drunk, but uh, intoxicated. If uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a beer in my hand, <laughs> I would say that it was a Heineken, though you know, <laughs> it was a good beer. So. <laughs> and and the next morning, I just kind of I just woke up and knew that it was over. And really, that day, and I, and I've been writing about that first day in my my new book which is coming out next year um about how happy i was even that first day even though i was hung over and nothing had really changed in terms of my life situation but i just felt a tremendous relief um and that that was that sense of that i look back on now as a spiritual awakening at the time i just thought you know Thank God I don't have to count my drinks anymore and worry about where to find the next, you know, joint or line of coke to snort. Um, but yeah, that was a it was a tremendous just moment of transformation. And as I say, I think a lot of times you don't realize that that's happening at the time. You just know, like, okay, I this is over. It's time to do something else. Now you grew up um, Catholic, and and <sighs> uh oh, <laughs> heavy sigh. <laughs> You're really going deep now. I am going deep. <laughs> um, d- I know a lot of my guests who uh, came from traditional religion and are now, you know, New Thought or Buddhist or other things. A lot of that Catholic guilt kind of um, was rooted in, in part of some of that. Is mm. Is that the case with you? Were you? Was that associated with the judgments that you had on yourself when you were drinking heavily or other? Um, you know, I, I actually think the Catholic guilt has, has helped me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I hadn't felt any guilt, I probably would have been behaved worse. Uh-huh. Um, I... I, I Hmm. Why Buddhism then? Why why not stay, you know, Catholic and 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 get clean and sober and then go back to yeah. the way you were raised? Well, I you know, I rejected Catholicism when I was a teenager and you know, my brother my older brother became an atheist and he kind of converted me. <laughs> 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 you know, I I've, I guess I've learned over the years to be very careful about what I say about other religions because the, the truth is that I think all, all religions can have beneficial and useful teachings and practices, and it's really very much an individual preference what works for us. I think it's poss- very possible to have a tremendous spiritual experience and awakening through Catholicism. And I know many wonderful Catholics. For me, it was more kind of a developmental, intellectual part of my life and kind of growing up in the 60s and rejecting a lot of things of mainstream culture. But I guess fundamentally, 
you know, again, just from my personal experience, and this isn't meant to be a, a sweeping statement, but just that I needed a spiritual path that didn't involve um, faith in something that I couldn't see and touch and experience for myself. And and I, th- I think that's true for a lot of people in our culture today. Um, and and that's where where um, a lot of other religions, be they Catholicism or uh, you know and uh, you know Hinduism or whatever, uh, just don't work for me because you know I, it just at a certain point, even though I can have faith to a certain point, when things get tough, I kind of my cynical mind kicks in and I have too much doubt to accept things just on faith. And so I need to have the direct experience. And that's what, that's what inspires me about Buddhism. Uh, And, you know, and rather than thinking of it in terms of, you know, rejecting something else, I, I don't think of it as rejecting something else. What I think of it is embracing the Buddhist path. When I, when I first encountered Buddhist teachings, they were so relevant to me, to my life. There was nothing abstract, mystical, uh, symbolic. It was just down-to-earth life, being in the present moment, experiencing suffering, seeing how that suffering was created by my mental states or my you know, physical states, and, and seeing that there was a way to let go of that moment by moment. And all of that just was very practical. And, you know, and in some ways... I. In that sense, Buddhism isn't so much a religion, right? It's more of a, about being a practice. I mean, I teach, I teach a class on Buddhism at a at a Catholic college, and um, I've had students say to me that their their experience of the Catholic Mass was enhanced by developing mindfulness through my class. Well, let's talk about that because Buddhism does have a lot of practices and. Uh, more practical applications and i don't know it is classified as a religion but i i don't know if it's more of a religion as it is a way of being and a way of living yeah well right did you want to say more about that um (laughs) well i would love for to hear from the teacher himself (laughs) yes about some of the practical applications yeah so um so, so this comes down to more of a cultural question in a way because Buddhism as it's being taught and practiced in the West and in in the United States I think is quite different from the way it's practiced in most of Asia where, where of course it comes from but even if you track the history of Buddhism you see that every country that's adopted Buddhism every place where it's kind of gone it's changed form in in a lot of ways that that uh, you know if you look at Tibetan Buddhism it's very ritualistic and uh, they have all sorts of kind of deities and and things and or you look at something like Pure Land Buddhism in China which posits a you know a, a another kind of realm in which we can be reborn and from there we can become enlightened if we chant this certain chant and a, a lot of that is very kind of faith based um, but most of the, mostly the way we understand Buddhism in the West is from the standpoint of mindfulness and the sort of intellectual side, the psychological side uh, the devotional and faith side many Westerners have just kind of let that go. And and so it's really um, a question of what you, what are you talking about when you talk about Buddhism, right? It, I mean, it's like talking about Christianity as one thing. It's not one thing. There are many different forms. So, um, you know, once you delve below the surface of the sort of popular um presentation or perception of Buddhism, you realize that the, it's it's not one thing. You can't really even define it. And th- that's one of the reasons why I don't even call myself a Buddhist, uh, because I think saying you're a Buddhist uh, just 
it doesn't really mean anything, and it's more like an uh, a badge to wear to to be cool or impress <laughs> people or something. And there are many ways in which I think I'm a bad Buddhist. In fact, my wife. <laughs> My wife says I should write a book called Bad Buddhist. and uh, Being know. a bad Buddhist? Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, I eat meat and... I was going to say, that was the first question I was going to say, are you vegan? <laughs> no, no. And, uh, you know, Do you I, kill mosquitoes and flot squares, uh, flies? Squat. Fla- no, oh, I'm I getting tongue-tied. <laughs> no, squat I flies. I out of my way to kill anything. But when <laughs> when ants swarm through my kitchen, uh, you know, I I bless them as I wipe them off. So I I try to kill them with love. Um, That is to say, with (laughs) without hatred. No, I'm I'm actually. I know it's it is funny, but I'm also serious in the sense that when you talk about the something like you know what's the bad karma of killing an ant, and and I don't know if there's something you know in the, in my future that I'm going to be punished in some way for doing that but I do know that when I kill a bug angrily it's painful for me and that's instant karma you know I'm instant <laughs> I'm feeling that pain like oh you're God. feeling the anger you're feeling the pain already right exactly yeah, and yeah. so if I can kind of go you know you really don't belong here you've come into the wrong place I'm sorry but you know, may you be reborn in a higher realm, and then spray the four hundred nine on them. <laughs> then you know it, it's a different energy, and and it that, is, it is. Know, so th- that is kind of my way of of practicing that precept in a you know imperfect way. Um, so you've taught meditation all over the world, including at Jack Kornfeld Center, the Spirit Rock Meditation Center, which is like. A big deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I started to meditate, I, you know, I wanted to, uh, because I'm like, you know, I wanted to be a rock star, right, when I was a musician. So when I became a... You're like the rock star of meditation, Well, Kevin. that's what I wanted, you know, when I started to meditate, I was like, oh, now I have to become like a, a meditation rock star. I want to be like Jack Hornfield and my famous meditation teachers. So, um, but uh, by the time I actually got around to you know, fulfilling that fantasy, it it had nothing to do with that. And and it's interesting for me that I still have a lot of ego around music. I, I, I actually released a CD of my music last year called Laughing Buddha, uh, plug. And, <laughs> but I don't have that same energy around, around teaching. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's really nice to be respected, but um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's not like something I feel like, like I'm going to brag about. I'm very I'm very pleased and grateful that I get to teach at Spirit Rock. Spirit Rock has been a spiritual home for me for for many years, ever since I moved to the Bay Area in '91 and. And uh, Jack was one of my first teachers back in the early 80s, 1981. I first practiced with him. So I have a long history with them. And, and yeah, I have a monthly class there called Dharma and Recovery that's, you know, for people in recovery, people in 12-step programs and people who want to explore the connections between Buddhism and recovery. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful class and group and and you know a lot of people come out and a lot of people discover spirit rock through that and that's that's one of my roles in the in the buddhist community is to kind of be a doorway and a a welcoming for people in recovery who want to explore meditation and explore buddhism but they might not be ready to kind of jump into a full full full-on like buddhist retreat or class but when they see something that says buddhism and the 12 steps they're like okay i can do this and and um you know i've been very happy and and you know i'm very proud of the fact that many people who have come to my classes just to check it out have, have become very serious in their practice over the years well, let's talk about the 12 steps because I I am not um, an alcoholic, but I love the 12 steps because it really is a personal development tool. Yeah. And what made you decide to merge 
your Buddhism and meditation practice and other things with that? I mean, obviously you had a history with um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, but w- did you just feel like it was a natural match or what? Where did you get this idea? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I definitely didn't think it was a natural match because when I got sober in 1985, I already had been doing a lot of Buddhist practice and, and sort of, I, I have to say, I, I think I had a more of a superficial understanding of Buddhism. I thought I knew a lot about it. but um, And when I saw the 12 steps, they, I didn't think they made any sense in relation to what I knew about Buddhism. So, so when I started out, I kept them really separate in my mind and in my life. I kept, you know, I would go to 12-step meetings and I would go to my Buddhist retreats and classes, but I never tried to merge them. Eventually, at about five or six years sober, I started to think about merging them because I think my original understanding of the 12 steps was kind of the typical way of taking it, uh, which is a little bit magical and kind of faith-based, actually. And that started to wear off as a as a workable approach for me. And, and I was getting more deeply into, I guess, more of an authentic Buddhist practice and, and study. And, and so I started to really ask those questions, like, is there a connection? Can I make a connection? And, and so little by little, that was about 1991. So over the next five or six years, uh, well, maybe more, I suppose, I started to kind of match things up a little bit and and get more creative i think which is what it really took i had to i had to bring a creativity to my exploration of the two and and so at that point it was really about my own practice and my own program and my own life and trying to make sense of these things wanting to have wanting to have some integration in my life rather than having these compartmentalized aspects of my spiritual life and then of course you know by about 96 97 uh, some of my teachers invited me to do give a talk here and there i'd been practicing buddhism for a long time by then and they saw you know wanted to start to mentor me as a teacher and as soon as i started to teach you know i i wanted to be authentic as a teacher, I didn't want to just sort of sit up there and try to pretend to be something, or, you know, try to pretend to be Jack Cornfield. Or, I just, I wanted to be myself. And, and so naturally kind of some of my 12 step thinking came through in my Buddhist teaching. Uh, and as soon as that happened, people started to come up to me after the classes and say, I want to hear more about that. Cause I'm in a program too. And that, that really surprised me because I, I was sort of embarrassed. I would say something from the 12 steps and, and then I'd be like, oh, I shouldn't say that because these people aren't alcoholics. And maybe <laughs> it turned out that a lot of them were alcoholics <laughs> because, you know, it's an anonymous program. So <laughs> you know, people weren't advertising that when they came to the Buddhist center. So I started to realize that my journey was not so unique and that maybe because of my experience, I might have something to offer that nobody else had to offer. Um, because most meditation teachers weren't alcoholics and addicts before they became meditation teachers. You know, most of them were kind of good, good people or whatever. You call <laughs> Goody, good. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're more normal. And that's very nice. For them. It never worked for me. So. Um, so I started to kind of, that was, that was sort of the beginning. And, and then over the years, um, it just kind of, you know, kept growing because I saw, well, there's this need for this and nobody else is offering it and, and people are responding to it. So little by little, I just offered more and more until then the idea for a book came about and, um, the rest is history. (laughs) I want to talk about something really profound that you just said, because you said, I realized that my journey was not so unique and that maybe I had something to offer. And um, I've worked a lot with um, 
addicts in recovery. And I hear something in, a lot, almost, you know, I would say over 80% of the addicts that I've talked to or worked with said, um, well, you know, I just thought I wasn't going to live to see 30. I just had this premonition that I was going to die young and then and I'm that I'm some unique special you know James Dean kind of person and I've only heard it with addicts have you heard this do you know what I'm talking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> I hear it constantly with addicts and they they think that it's this unique thing only to them and that no one understands them yeah. and that they're gonna die young yeah and and I don't know why, but it just seems to be a recurring theme. So I wanted to discuss it with you from what you said. Well, an old friend of mine in L.A. who was also a musician, uh, you know, who got sober around the time I did, used to say, well, I always thought I was going to um, record three albums that would change the world and then die at 27. Something similar to that. Yeah. <laughs> But pretty much that, but with something else, but pretty much that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and The Who, of course, put it very succinctly in, I guess, their first song, My Generation, I Hope I Die Before I Get Old. Um, so, yeah, I think that there is a, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think that what you're pointing to is what we call in the program terminal uniqueness. And the the sense that, Yes, we're special, we're unique, nobody understands us. and Like tortured artist syndrome? Yes. And, and you don't have to be an or- artist to, to participate. <laughs> you can just pretend to be an artist. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's a couple things I can say about that. First is that I think that being an addict, there is something very lonely about it. And a sense of disconnection from the world, a sense and and because your inner feelings and your inner experience of life doesn't really match up with the way life is portrayed in our culture and maybe by your teachers or your parents. And you kind of feel like an outsider or an outlier, someone who's not really part of this world and it's for me it was really only when I started to go to meetings that I felt um, normal you know when I heard people share and realized wow what I've been experiencing all my life is not unique to me and it's not a mistake it's okay to have these feelings and and I can live and survive and thrive even though, you know, I have this sort of uh, what we call disease. I'm not sure that's the best description of addiction, but for lack of, you know, lack of a better word. So, so there's that side of it, you know, that's, that's about, that, that I think is, is a real thing that, that I have some compassion for and self-compassion for as well that, that makes people feel unique. And... <laughs> On the other hand, obviously that feeling of uniqueness or thinking that you're unique is very egotistical. And there, so there, the other side of it is this ego that thinks I'm so special and, and um, you know, no one can touch me. I'm too uni- special and unique. And, and that is a, is a very um, destructive thing because it's, it does – set you apart from the world and, and um, create a very cynical and... Um, and that in turn makes you feel more separate from society. Yes. Like you said, and isolated and lonely. It's, right. a, and it's it, a cycle. Right. It feeds itself. And, and so th- that part of it is the terminal uniqueness, you know, and, and to realize... I mean, one of, one of my experiences in the program was thinking when I arrived, that I had a really interesting history and an interesting story. And, you know, people tell their stories in 12-step meetings, and they'll tell their whole arc of their addiction and their, from their childhood up, up to getting sober and, and onward. And, and I always thought, oh, I have such an interesting story. 
And then after a year or two, after hearing dozens of other people's stories, I realized, wow, I'm just another alcoholic addict. I'm really not, you know, my story is not particularly interesting. Uh, I've heard better, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and and that's, again, very freeing. Uh, uh, because it's the, what the stay in the steps about humility, you know, and the importance of of being right sized. Um, that that when you can see yourself as just another imperfect, striving hu- human being, someone who's just trying to make the best of their life, uh, rather than this unacknowledged genius or hero. Uh, you know the the lonely hero, you know, which is a, a very American <laughs> kind of idea too. You know, John Wayne out in the uh, in the West riding his horse off into the sunset. You know, it, that you know what happens when the sun goes down. You know, <laughs> it's not pretty. I don't know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> you sound great, Kevin. Uh-huh. Um, so you said, you know, kind of something, uh, and you were a little bit dismissive of it, but I, I, I really want to talk about it because it's it's been a big issue um, in the medical community. You said, well, alcohol, alcoholism, this disease, well, I wish there was a better word for it because there's been a debate whether it is a disease or not. Yeah. Um, I kind of see pros and cons of both. You know, I think that um, I've seen many people do recovery and personal development work and heal their um, addiction. And then I've seen people who kind of have been disempowered by the disease label saying, well, I can't control it. There's nothing I can do about it. I was born this way. My parents were alcoholics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is your view on that? Mm. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, you know, I came up through a traditional 12 step. I mean, I came to sobriety and recovery through a tr- traditional 12-step approach. and But when I started to kind of go public and teach uh, about Buddhism and recovery, I started to learn a lot of other things that aren't you don't hear in 12-step meetings. And I started to hear a lot of different viewpoints. And I had to open up my mind in that regard. And, and you know, I... I spent quite a bit of time with the late Alan Marlat, who was probably the leading addiction researcher and one of the first addiction researchers. And and he explained to me why he did not accept the disease model. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't really... (laughs) I I got it when he told it to me. You cannot articulate it. (laughs) Um, But... It was it was convincing. I got, I understood what he was saying, and he had some really good points. And you know, it kind of for me, it comes down to first of all, I have to say that I'm not an addiction professional. I'm not a trained counselor. I'm not even a trained psychologist. No, so um, I don't think that my opinion is particular is really worth much in that regard you know I, 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 and, but even more than that i think that debating those kind of questions i i know it has a role in a certain kind of environment like if you're trying to re- get money from the government or insurance or something it, then you know whether it's a disease or not and whether it's in the dsm and all that you know is important but that's not my that's not my area. Uh, uh, that's not where I'm operating, and, I'm, and I and I feel as if those kinds of debates for for the person in recovery can really be a distraction. And I'd rather. Well, I guess I guess what I was I was thinking was because I had friends who had rejected the idea that it was a disease, and it was more empowering for them in their recovery process because for them to say that. There was something disempowering uh-huh. for them to say that they were an alcoholic and they had no control, like I'm an alcoholic, and I know that's part of the traditional 12-step model. Right. And what they what they were more comfortable embracing was to say that they had underlying um, 
emotional baggage that needed to be repaired and alcohol was a symptom of that Mm -hmm. instead of it being a disease and being something that a sickness or illness something wrong with them i guess and more of the model of being perfect whole and complete and just having some baggage to let go of and that they were using alcohol and drug addiction as a symptom of that baggage you know if that works for somebody i think that's great i i am completely you know, supportive of that what i'm always interested in is the risks in any stance and the risk in that stance is that you use that as a, a way of saying at a certain point that you f- say well you know i've really worked through my issues and I don't have this underlying baggage anymore because I've done a lot of therapy and, you know, I've meditated or whatever. You know, I've outgrown it, however, whatever it is. Now I can drink again. You know? So I'm always looking for that, just that kind of little crack or doorway that people give themselves that's, that might be their... Rationalization. Their rationalization. Yeah. But let me... So, but, but as I say... If that if it's if that's really true what they're saying and it's working for them and it's sustainable for them, it's I think it's fine. I, I don't I don't think that there are r- rules about how people get or stay clean and sober. It's you know people try to say that you have to do this or you have to do that, but what I've seen is that people can do everything right and still relapse. And they can do everything wrong and not relapse. So it, you know, <laughs> okay. it's just there's something else. For, for me, what it's come down to is that I believe that the most important aspect of getting and maintaining recovery is the strength of motivation of the individual. That's what I think is the most important thing. And that's why interventions so often fail in the long term because it's it's not the personal motivation of the individual. Oftentimes I hear from parents, oh, my parent, son is a heroin addict, my daughter is an alcoholic, what can I do? And yeah, you can do, you can try to help them, you can send them to rehab, whatever, but if they aren't motivated, it doesn't matter whether they go to meetings or they go to rehab or they say that they're an alcoholic or they say that they aren't an addict, you know, it, it, it's the motivation, I think, that's more important than anything whether you say you're a, it's a disease or whatever so whatever works for people i'm all for um I, but I, I also just let me say one other thing about it rosie that the people are debate this but to go back and look at why alcoholism particularly was first called a disease is because in the 1930s, when the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were trying to figure out how to stay sober, people considered alcoholism to be a moral failure. And, and alcoholics were shamed and, uh, um, you know, ostracized. And so they wanted to make a shift in the cultural understanding in the society's understanding of what an alcoholic was and they kind of i think they just kind of came on the idea oh well it's kind of like a disease it's not like i'm just a bad i'm a bad person it's more like so you don't blame somebody for having a disease right but you blame mm-hmm. them for their if they're morally you know uh, corrupt and so that that was the motivation for calling it a disease and then they got the AMA to sign on with that and you know that was it was for a purpose it wasn't I, I don't see it as so much like oh they figured out exactly that it is a disease but it was like they they were trying to find something else to call it other than for people it. to be more accepting and for the recovery process to be a little less judgmental right. and, and so yeah. over time now people have started to see wait but then there's this thing about a disease that's like you know as you say you know you become a victim or you're you know there's that's there's something wrong with you and so now people are kind to readjust that i yeah i i understand that it's but again it just kind of, for me it's more comes 
back to language and and if you spend too much time debating the language you're missing the bigger issue which is just drink don't drink or use and don't worry about what you call yourself <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that works. Um, so you focus mo- mainly on, or your expertise is mindful recovery. And what would be the difference between maybe a traditional 12 step program and the point of view that you are presenting? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's a, that's a big question. I'll try, I'll try to come up with an answer. <laughs> It'll take the rest of the afternoon um, f- first of all I would say that my approach to recovery and to the 12 steps is what I call contemplative so that means that I bring the meditative tools and practices into the whole process Whereas if you look at the 12 steps, the only place where meditation is even mentioned is in step 11. But for me, I use meditation in all 12 steps, 1 through 12. And when I teach, I'm asking people to kind of reflect and contemplate through that lens. The, the, and, you know, the Buddhist lens kind of includes the it's called the three characteristics the truth of suffering the truth of impermanence the truth of not self or corelessness and so we kind of look at a step or an aspect of recovery through that lens which is sort of an impersonal lens that corelessness or not self like this is just arising what am i experiencing right now how am i feeling this um where is this, what's the cause and effect? So I'm looking at the, the law of karma, what, what actions bring what results. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of a, it's bringing this contemplative attitude and this body of Buddhist teachings into the steps to get at something um, what I, I consider deeper, although that, that's kind of a, you know, I don't, I don't like to claim like oh, you know, it's better or whatever, but but when you, it's a different, it's a different it's understanding. Different. You know the way that people often work the twelve steps in a traditional model is that there's a lot of writing, and you're sitting down with a sponsor maybe and telling them what you're feeling, and and there maybe there's more prayer kind of involved and sort of. Um, you know, I'm turning my will and my life over to God, so I'm going to ask God to take care of something. Uh, and it, so the, the Buddhist approach is, is um, as I say, much more contemplative and meditative and, and kind of uh, so stepping back and kind of looking at yourself and your life and the world through this lens of Dharma that, uh, that really changes our understanding of the world um, and and breaks us out of both personal uh, kind of prejudices and taking things personally and also helps us to see through societal or cultural uh, biases and, um, you know, just things like, oh, society sells me if I get rich, I'll be happy, you know, the seeing through things like that. Uh, which is d- certainly part of any spiritual path. Mm-hmm. And for you, Kevin, what has been the toughest step for you in the process, or has it been varying? <laughs> uh-uh. The the toughest step in terms of recovery, or the t- yeah, which was there a step that gave you a you were working them and you thought and you were stuck uh, a little bit longer than another one? <laughs> well, for sure, step four, writing the searching and fearless moral inventory was really difficult. Um, and it took me several months, I think, to do that. And um, and then, you know, after that, step nine, making direct amends to those I had harmed, uh, at least that was something more like tearing the bandage off that I could do quickly. 
but mm -hmm. it was <laughs> it was hard to pick up that telephone. They talk about the five hundred pound telephone, you know, to to call the people I needed to make amends with. Yeah, and 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 I think that's the hardest part of the program in an ongoing way. That is admitting when we're wrong and being and, and yeah, admitting when we're wrong and and trying to make amends, but especially admitting, at least for me, admitting when I'm wrong. And, and that's because that's so fundamental to all relationships, especially the most intimate relationships, especially for me in my marriage, when I can stop being defensive and, uh, and, and step back and, and see where I've made a mistake or, or where I don't need to create conflict that's where harmony in my in my marriage comes and and I think that's true of you know most relationships and it's so hard to do because you know ego doesn't like to be wrong and I actually think that everyone should work the steps. I originally became aware of the community through my stand up because I was performing at um, recovery shows oh, cool. and I am a big advocate of personal development and I started working the steps myself just as a personal development tool and I would say um, you know some people in recovery may be further along than quote-unquote normal people because I know a lot of people that don't have any issues with recovery and they definitely uh, need to make amends <laughs> Or yeah. do other admitting of wrongs. <laughs> that is just a tool for life, I think. Right. Um, a lot of these tools are just practical tools for life to better yourself as a human being. And I'm a huge advocate um, for everyone to become aware of them. And the founders of um, the program actually did quite a bit of personal development work and new thought work, spirituality work mm -hmm. when they were coming up with these steps. Yeah. So, yeah. um uh, where where can we find you? Where can we, what are you doing next? What's oh, what's the next step yeah. for Mr. Kevin Griffin? Well, my website is kevingriffin.net dot net, and um, I have my teaching schedule on there. Um, I'm going to be in the East Coast in September for a couple of retreats uh, at Kripalu Institute and up in Vermont. No, are these recovery retreats? Or are they Buddhist retreats or both? They're Buddhist recovery retreats. <laughs> both? <laughs> yes. This is, what, this is what I teach. I mean, uh, you know, my books uh, kind of, you know, this is what, what my writing is about. And so I take that, what I put in the books, I take it out and help people to apply it themselves. So we, you know, in my retreats, we practice meditation. We talk about Connecting Buddhism and the Twelve Steps. Um, it's, it's really rich, rich work. Do you have to be a Buddhist or can you be a Catholic? Well, I like, as I said, I'm not even, I don't even call myself a Buddhist. So absolutely, you don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to be anything. You can be whatever you are. Uh -huh. um, how long are your retreats usually? Um, you know, it really it really depends on where I'm teaching. Any sometimes I'll teach a day long retreat. Many times it'll be a weekend or a long weekend, a three day weekend, something like that. Occasionally it's a little longer, four or five days. And some of them are. I have two or three retreats a year that are largely silent. There's periods of talking, but there's a lot of just silent meditation and and. Uh, you know, silent meals and things, and then some of my retreats are much more kind of open. When I'm when I'm teaching at somewhere like a yoga center where there's other things going on, then it'll be more of a a workshop kind of approach. Do you have anything else for the listeners to know about Buddhism and recovery? Well, um, I should say there's an organization called the Buddhist Recovery Network, and we have a website called BuddhistRecovery.org. Uh, and that lists Buddhist recovery meetings all over the world. So twelve step meetings that are Buddhist based. Yeah, they're they're not. Some of them aren't even twelve step based because there's there's more and more Buddhists now who are trying to create something that's even not twelve step at all. That, but it's still to me it's still twelve step. But they're because of the God issue. Some Buddhists are kind of trying to sort of 
uh, create something that's a recovery path that doesn't include some of the those the language some of the language but it, it winds up when you look at what they're really doing it's still basically the same work so there's all kinds of of meetings on there most of them are kind of buddhist 12 step meetings some of them are not well, Kevin, you have been delightful. Um, guys, check out his website, kevingriffin.net. He is the author of Buddhism and the 12 Steps and also a meditation teacher. And you guys can check out his workshops. This has been Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. Guys, we are sponsored by HugMeTease.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTease.com. And don't forget to visit us on SoundCloud.com slash Out of the Box Podcast and also iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Also on outoftheboxpodcast.com, we now have a support button. Click on the support button and use one of our affiliates, and it helps us out a lot. And that's it. This has been Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. Mm-hmm.